This episode is brought to you by Summer School Electronics. With pedals like the Snow Day Delay, the Pep Rally Fuzz, the Trash Panda, and my personal favorite, the Science Fair, which is two classic dirt pedals in one with a mid-boosted overdrive on one side, a black lab rat circuit on the other, and a blend knob to blend between them to find the perfect classic stacked dirt sound you're looking for, it's hard not to find something you'll love. Mark builds all of his pedals by hand in Syracuse, New York, where he also works as a full-time educator. In addition to the super fun graphics on their pedals, Mark also offers custom artwork. Want your dog's face on a pedal? He can do it. Want your face on a pedal? He can make that happen too. Go over to summerschoolelectronics.com and make sure to tell them that 40 Watt Podcast sent you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the 40 Watt Podcast. I genuinely can't tell you what number in season we are. No, we're in season three. I'm sorry. I'm a musician. I count to four, and that's where I stop. So I think I've actually used that joke before, and I'm really sorry if you've heard it. Um, so we're back. Really excited to get into this episode, but I'm going to cover a couple of things. Uh, like last week, I covered thanking my Patreon supporters at the top of the episode rather than the end of the episode, because by the end of the episode... I've forgotten to do it, and that's just who I am as a person. Y'all know my ADHD and the way this works. So, I'm going to thank all of my current Patreon supporters very, very much for their support, and I'm going to name you out by name uh, as soon as I find it. There we go. Thank you, Bradley Jones, Jordan Glash, Duncan Watson, Andy Johns, David Evangelista from the Guitar Dads podcast, Blake Jefferson, Nick Call, Andrew Hensley, Alan Gresham. Dan Pilver of Lewitt Microphones, or I'm sorry, Lewitt Audio, Scott Hamilton of the Effects Loop Podcast, Andy Koning, Jim Burns, Tom Kelly, Heath Bat, Ben Fair of Electromotive Sound Company, Rick Calhoun of Honey Picks, Jeffrey Walks, and Kyle Harris. I hope all of you are enjoying your care package I sent you with um, some stickers, button, uh, a 40 watt pin, even some custom 40 watt Honey Picks, if I can get that to focus. These are super rad. I'm super excited about them. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I like these a bunch. I got a few more, so hopefully some of y'all be sticking around for a full year or more as well. Um, those, those went out to those of you that have been with me for 12 months or more consecutively, so I greatly appreciate it. All right, there we go. That's the shilling at the top of the show that I'm done. So on this episode, super excited to have um, John Snyder from... John, I'm going to let you say the name of the company because I have said this three times out loud today and I transpose words on it. So I'm going to let you say it. Yeah. Hey, everyone. I'm John from Electronic Audio Experiments. That's um, it. A company I would have named differently if I knew I was going to do this for a living. <laughs> yeah, because I have definitely said audio electronic or it, it, the experiments always stays at the end, but I, I keep transposing it. So I didn't want to mess it up, but it's EAE. That's the acronym I see everybody talk about when they talk about your pedals. Yeah, it's much much easier to just go off the acronym. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I'm a giant nerd, like phenomenally huge nerd, and I'm sure that all of my you know regular listeners know this. I'm a big old like fantasy D and D nerd, like hardcore. And so I remember the first time I saw the long sword, and I was like, these are my people. I don't own one right now, and I, I think I looked, and the, the longsword wasn't available right now. Is that right? Yeah, they're they're uh, despite our best efforts, still a little hard to get these days. Yeah, yeah, I get it. So, but I I remember seeing those pedals, and then when uh, I started messaging you, trying to get you on the podcast, I was super excited because, I mean, again, it's my people. So let's back up though before we dive into the the super nerdy stuff. Uh, let's dive back into how'd you get into guitar, how'd you get into music, and how'd you get into deciding you wanted to be a lunatic and start a pedal company? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I grew up in a very musical household. Um, you know, my parents, I like, I have so many different uh, kinds of music. Um, you know, it was the Beatles, it was musicals, it was classic rock, it was uh, classical music, a lot of classical music okay. in my house growing up. Um and, uh, you know, my folks wanted us to, to play an instrument that would kind of help us succeed or whatever. So, um, uh, at age six, I started playing the violin, um, 
my brother was uh started piano at the same time he was age four um and uh we were doing suzuki methods it was all mm. learning by ear and uh you know it was it was just a really you know, it was a great way to get started because you know when you're a little kid you you don't want to read sheet music or anything um you just need somebody to tell you how to hold the instrument the right way and then you're off to the races and so it definitely inspired this uh you know this kind of like playful um like sort of exploratory approach to musical instruments um which you know once private lessons and orchestras and quartets and stuff like that ramp up it's pretty hardcore you know it's like oh well there's this pressure to like you know you have to do a really good job at this so you can go to college you know it's yeah. the it's the classic millennial dilemma right <laughs> and uh you know for me i uh you know to kind of blow off steam i also picked up electric guitar and i was like well i was age 13 yeah. um i really wanted girls to like me um and i, I you know i was uh just like a skinny little nerd with like a napoleon dynamite haircut uh to give you <laughs> to paint to paint a picture for you um and uh, my favorite thing to do was uh, Lego robotics. So I really needed to like. You were super you know, popular. To, to get the D&D stuff going early, I needed to put some points into charisma. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, um, and so, uh, you know, I started teaching myself guitar and I thought, oh, well, it can't be that hard, right? I mean, it's got strings, you know, uh, yeah. I don't have to worry about being in tune. There's frets. There's no bow to worry about. Um, and so the first time I picked up a guitar, I tried tuning it like a violin because I thought this was going to be a cheat code. And I immediately snapped the high E string, uh, <laughs> cut my hand. And I was like, well, this is dumb. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, this was like me borrowing one from my buddy for a while. And, uh, you know, I ended up coming back around to it because my younger brother uh, had gotten one as a birthday present. And I was actually the first one to play it because to surprise him, we decided that we would. He was a really heavy sleeper. So you might be able to see where this is going. Yeah. We set up the amp next to his bed, plugged in the guitar. I turned all the knobs on the amp all the way up. I turned the amp all the way up, and then I just slammed, you know, I didn't know any chords, so I just hit all the open strings. So it's just that, you know, that open string guitar sound. Yeah. Um, and he shot out of bed like a rocket. And then ever since, I was like, oh, I like noise rock now. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, so I was, you know, like he he actually was like, he had first dibs on the guitar. And he, like, learned a bunch of Beatles songs and got bored with it. My brother's one of those people who... Uh, can, who gets really, really good at things uh, in intense phases for like six months at a time. Right. And then he just, he just drops it, you know? Oh, um, yeah. So, so then I was like, Oh, it's my turn to play the guitar now um, for real. And so I learned, you know, Blink-182 fallout boy songs, like stuff that, you know, someone who was in middle school and high school in the, in the two thousands would be uh, getting into. So, you know, because I was also a nerd in other facets, I realized, oh, well, I'm drawn to guitar because there's like stuff that you plug in. There are knobs that you turn. You know, if you um, if you break it and take it apart, there's wires inside. And this was great because, you know, I was the kind of kid who was, you know, taking apart VCRs and stuff when I was when I was right. Little. And so oh, for, uh, for, for those of you Zennials, VCRs were these devices that played <laughs> a cassette tape this big or so you put it in and it showed movies magically um all of the distortion and fuzziness was just you know that was a fringe benefit mm -hmm. true <laughs> now you can just get a pedal that does that it, uh, we don't need VCR. it's true i have one <laughs> the the gen <laughs> no, the gen no, loss yeah yep um so uh so yeah so like it all kind of it, in retrospect feels like a very natural evolution of the stuff i was getting into um but I didn't really, so I, you know, I would do things like pickup swaps and stuff like that. Um, sure. You know, I, uh, like I was, I was like retubing amps. I was, I was doing like light mods to things, you know, like I remember the first time I ever like cut the bright cap out of an amp, you know, it felt like my friends and I felt like we were doing open heart surgery. <laughs> um, and so we, uh, you know, so when I was in, you know, fast forward a little bit, um, you know, when I was in my senior year of high school and college. I was doing like a summer internship at this local manufacturing company um, and their primary output was industrial joysticks. So, you know, it was, uh, you know, basically like a joystick with a circuit board attached to it. So there would usually be some sort of mechanical configuration um, or, you know, some sensors or something and then a circuit board with a bunch of junk on it. Um, I it's funny because at the time I didn't know any electronics. Nowadays, I could look at one of those schematics and tell you exactly what it was doing, but I don't have access to that anymore. So I can right. only guess, but you know, I learned uh, how to work in a manufacturing floor. I learned how to solder. Um, I learned how to stuff circuit boards. Um, I learned a little bit of uh, like PCB layout, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, 
you know, but they also kind of encouraged me to take parts out of the trash can. Um, and so there I, you know, there I was like at the end of the day, just kind of like scrounging around to the engineering <laughs> junk. Um, and I eventually amassed enough parts to build myself a clone of the Zvex Super Hard On, which is a classic DIY circuit. It is. The only off the shelf parts I had to order were the enclosure, the jacks, and the foot switch. And this was, this must have been in like, gosh, this must have been like 2009, 2010, okay. maybe 2011. But, you know, at the time, like there wasn't really the infrastructure of uh, stuff there is today. And so, like, the foot switch was like, Twelve dollars, right. you know, it was like crazy expensive, you know, because this stuff just it just wasn't what it is today. And you didn't have access at the time, like online to wholesalers. Like now, we can just exactly. go online and find a wholesaler, and they'll sell to anybody. Mm-hmm. You had to find, you know, like the second or third hand <laughs> down the line guy yeah. find, selling it. Yeah, we basically just had Small Bear Electronics, who yeah. uh, you know, fast forward today are uh, we're subletting from. So mm-hmm. it's kind of wild how that works out. Yeah. Um, where they're, they're downstairs from us, but we, you know, so I, I put together this pedal and it worked and it made my guitar sound better. And I was kind of hooked at that point. And so, you know, I had done, uh, other, like some kind of ill-advised mods to things and I was, I was hacking up a lot of stuff. Right. Eventually I got into, um, Mad Bean pedals who are like a very classic DIY outfit. And I used, uh, you know, like a few of their boards to build sort of like tweak clones of classic stuff. You know, I build like a tube screamer with a diode switch for a bandmate, that kind of thing. Um, and so that was kind of my like side thing when I was in college, um, and me and, uh, my friend Matt, who, who, uh, eventually went to go work as the like lead designer at adventure audio for a number of years. Um, we had a company that was called beer money pedals, um, because we thought, <laughs> well, you know, you sure can get a lot of beer money if you're doing this. Um, but we spent the entire time trying to, uh, simulate a boss HM2 clone only for it not to work. So oh, no. we didn't get very far, but the, 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 the intent was there. Like I knew I wanted to get into this. Um, and so I was doing like clone builds for friends just to like, and bandmates and stuff, um, through college. Um, you know, and I also kind of had the reputation as like the, the, the guy in the band who knows stuff about gear. Um, you know, I was playing in bands around this time and I learned a lot of things about how to make a guitar sound good live, you know, or in the studio. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and it's stuff that, that I still take with me today. I didn't fully know what I was doing at the time, but even just drawing on those memories and experiences of playing in bands, um, really was helpful. So I was playing in this like loud kind of, you know, like post hardcore band. It was called native wildlife. We were not very good, but we had some, we had our moments, you know, and I got to tour a little bit, um, made a lot of friends, people who I still, you know, I'm in touch with today, which is a really valuable thing. Um, and so then once that band chilled out, I graduated college, uh, I moved back home for about a year to like try to pay down some of my student loans again, yeah. classic millennial experience. Yep. And so I was like long distance with my now wife. Um, you know, I had a lot of free time in my hands. I had a little bit more disposable income because I wasn't paying rent to live with my folks, which was really nice. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so I just started, you know, buying more pedal kits and stuff like that and learning a little bit more. You know, I bought myself like a nice soldering iron and all these things. And, uh, you know, it kind of, it kind of laid the groundwork. Like I, I knew I wanted to make an original design, but I didn't quite have the know how to do it. Um, you know, I went to, my undergrad was in physics, so it was a lot of very heady stuff. It was a lot of math, yeah. not a lot of hands-on. Um, but I did take one electrical engineering course my senior year just to like see what the big deal was. And I was like, uh oh, <laughs> I should have been doing this the whole time. <laughs> um, you know, as much as I liked the sort of headiness of all the physics stuff I was learning, I realized I liked the hands-on practical stuff more. And sure. also I'd been burned out on like a few years of hardcore math. So, uh, you know, so I actually went back to school for electrical engineering. Um, and so, uh, you know, when I, in the first, the first semester was like a breath of fresh air because it was all this practical stuff. Yeah. The second semester, uh, was a winter that people in Boston sometimes refer to actually, I don't know if this is just me and my friends or whatever, but called, we call it the snowpocalypse <laughs> because Boston got about 120 inches of snow that winter. Um, that sounds terrible. In- as as oh, a was, Mississippi kid, <laughs> like that <laughs> that sounds like my very special hell. That's <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, it's it was so I lived uh, on top of a hill in a basement apartment. So getting uh, on and off the hill with all this snow was uh, oh, no. an enormous undertaking, and then uh, getting into and out of the basement was a, a entirely separate undertaking. So. You know, my friends and I, we would like, there was literally one time where we took a sled down to the hill because at the bottom of the hill, there was a 7-Eleven and a liquor store. 
<laughs> and we would just, you know, we just loaded up, loaded this up with, uh, with like frozen pizzas and beer and just like dragged it back up the hill because no one wanted to go anywhere. <laughs> and so, I mean, this was the uh, an amount of snow that in Boston, I was having classes, not just, not just like postponed or anything like that, but outright canceled. Oh, you know, nowadays it would have just been, no oh, do it remote, but yeah. like I had a lot of free time on my hands. And so we were, you know, we were playing video games. I was playing guitar and I was like, you know what? I'm going to, des- I'm going to design that pedal I've been wanting to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I got, I, I got started on it. Like I had learned just enough electronics and I was able to say, okay, I want to put these gain stages and I'm going to start by borrowing this EQ from this amp that I like, and I'm going to tweak it a bunch. And I learned how to use a circuit simulator, like for real. Um, and the result was the long start version one. Um, and uh, at the time, I was getting some pretty good advice uh, from my friend, uh, Nicholas Williams, who uh, used to run the company Dunwich Amps. Okay. Um, you know, he he definitely, I, I I really looked up to him because I loved that he was making amps. I loved that he was doing pedals. Um, for a while, I actually thought I was going to be doing amps and not pedals. Um, and so, you know, but I had this this pedal idea. I built my first tube amp. Like this this semester, because I had all this extra free time from all of the canceled, canceled mm-hmm. classes and stuff. I was actually able to like put in real time into self-study just enough to get myself off the ground. And at that point it was like, I, I had fully fallen in love with this stuff. And so it wasn't much longer after the long sword came out that I designed the model FET. Um, and then after that, it was just like one thing after another, you know, just always crammed in the edges. Obviously school picked back up and took a lot of my time. Sure. So production was very stop start. Um, but I really, uh, you know, it became like a real thing. And so the, where the name came from, originally when I was doing this, I had a blog called Electronic Audio Experiments. And that was where I was documenting my electronic audio experiments. You know, the pedals I built for friends, the modifications I was doing, the tube amp repair, like that kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, when I when I did the first run of Long Swords, I was like, well, how do I identify this? I guess it's just going to be the the title of the blog. Um, and that's where it came from. But the first long swords actually just had, it was, I made like a stencil out of cardboard and used like a paint marker to draw a sword on it. I'm fairly sure that of the ones that are remaining, none of them have the paint still on them. So it's just <laughs> in this like purple enclosure. It's better that way. They looked terrible, but people, people bought them. People thought that what I was doing was just interesting enough to take a chance on it. Yeah. And without those 15 or so people, I mean, like who knows what I'd be doing. Um, and, uh, I think about that a lot. Yeah. So you know, so when I was progressing through school, I, I was, you know, I was doing batches of pedals. I eventually enlisted the help of my friend Brad, who's now like the, my like right hand guy, general manager at the shop. And, uh, you know, he because he used to live down the street from me. OK, um, we were introduced because I needed to borrow a drill press from, from, you know, I was I was working <laughs> on something. I was in the middle of a move and I needed a drill press. I don't even know what it was. Um, but someone was like, how do you not know Brad? He lives in, he lives in your neighborhood. And so I walked over there and I was there for like two hours cause we were just shooting the shit the whole time. You know, like it was like, we were just, you know, we were, we were friends already. We didn't know it. Right. Um, and so then he was able to help me out with building and I could, you know, what little time I had, I could use to design stuff and run social media and do all answer emails. Not a lot has changed really. <laughs> you know, I think he's, he's still the one who does so, so much of the actual like nuts and bolts assembly stuff. And I feel like my job is answering emails so that he has parts to build the stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, but he, he really, he really makes the whole thing go around. So that was, that worked out pretty well for uh, a couple of years. Uh, The releases got more ambitious and we started to uh, attract a bit of a following, Um, you know, getting to the point where it was like, Oh, this is a, a, you know, this is a brand that people are excited about. There's, there's sort of lingering demand for, for pedals, you know, it used to be, I would have to build, you know, 15 of something on a Saturday. Right. And that was enough. And then it was like, oh, we have to do, you know, 30 and then 50 and then maybe a hundred pedals at a time. And building a hundred pedals at a time is an undertaking if it's your part-time job. You know, it was at the point where I was having a bunch of friends over and we would just get, we would order a pizza and sit around my, my dining room table and everyone would build pedals. See, this that was this, pretty fun. This is the part where earlier I said, what made you uh, like what lunatic idea did you have to start a pedal company? This is the point where yeah. this is the lunacy part of it. This is the yes. insane insanity, pure insanity. Yep. And eventually it's like, oh, this thing is sustaining itself. You know, I, I could have said, oh, well, I'm going to go get a real job mm-hmm. and this thing and open source all these designs and then just design for for the love of designing, which I strongly considered. Um, and then this little thing called the pandemic happened. Um, and so I, 
So I, I've been trudging through grad school. Um, it was an extremely difficult time for me. Um, I was on a project that by all accounts, I think was really not impossible, but effectively impossible sure. um, with the resources that I had, with the support that I had. It was a small research group. Um, what I was doing was really, really niche. So it's not like there were a lot of people I could talk to. I was spending hours and hours and hours in a clean room, sometimes working like, you know, late nights, sometimes working overnight because a lot of clean room stuff you'd book on a shared calendar. And sometimes the availability on a piece of popular equipment might only be at two in the morning. Right. And it's like, guess what? I'm going to sleep during the day. I'm going to go get on the bus, go to school, uh, you know, uh, put on my bunny suit and, and get to work. <laughs> um, you know, and then it would be like a lot of these procedures would be like 30 minutes of really intense, like bench top tweezer work, followed by five hours of sitting there while the thing you put together sits in an oven. But you can't leave the oven. You've got to be there for it. Right. right? And so I was using that time to lay out circuit boards too. It worked out fairly well for me. But, you know, so it was like this weird stop start, like highly stressful periods interspersed with not so stressful, but still like this like lingering existential dread. Um, <laughs> Truly and, millennial uh, right there. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and so for a while, um, you know, we were waiting for um, this laser to come in. I needed this fancy laser to test the devices that I was making in, this, in the clean room. And uh, the the laser showed up in February of 2020. So we spent it landed. Um, literally, the company flew in a technician to help us install it and train us on it. This guy this guy stayed in Boston for two full weeks helping us put it together because this is like this was probably a quarter million dollar laser. Right. Um, if I were to guess, this is this was like the, the most serious piece of equipment I've ever used for any singular piece of equipment I've ever used for anything. And uh, you know, we get it all up and running. We're ready to rock. Uh, and March rolls around and my, my advisor was like, things are looking a little weird. You might want to come up with a backup plan. And I was like, whatever. Um, and obviously we all know how that worked yeah. out. And so I ended up basically writing my thesis was here's what I would have done if I had the tools to do it. <laughs> um, it was very speculative, but, uh, I was able to successfully defend it. I think that the end result was as good as it could have possibly been under the circumstances. Right. Um, and uh, then I was like, time to go be burned out. I don't want to do this anymore. Um, and so this was May of 2020. So like we had, you know, we'd had a few months of, of you know, being accustomed to working from home. Uh, there was actually a period where I was like kind of on standby because if things opened back up early, I would have gone back to the lab. And so I had about a month where I was like just doing pedal <coughs> stuff because there was nothing to do. Yeah. And that was actually kind of cool. And then I realized, okay, I got to get this thesis out the door. Let's focus on that. But, uh, you know, I said, OK, I'm going to give myself like a couple of months and do this pedal thing. I can make just enough money to squeak by. Um, and then maybe I can I can offload everything to a contract manufacturer or sell the brand and go go get a quote unquote real job. Right. Right. And that didn't happen. Um, you know, I, I realized I liked it. Um, there was definitely a pedal boom. Um, there was people were excited about what we were doing. They were excited about the availability. And so uh, after a year of in this room building pedals and like I would I would get in my car and I would drive boxes of parts over to Brad uh Brad, Brad's place because he and his wife moved out of the city um in like 2019 you know and I would I would then bring the finished pedals back here I would pack them up and ship them drive them up to the post office up the street and uh about after a year of that I was like wow I'm really tired of all the dog hair in my packages <laughs> uh let's go get a real shop and so we did um I convinced Brad to quit his job uh, wow and the rest is history. And so we've got a couple other people at that location. Um, during this time, I also partnered up with uh, Hawker from Asheville Music Tools. Um, and so he and I do a lot of stuff together behind the scenes. The companies are kind of joined at the hip because he's taught me a lot of what I know about the more advanced analog uh, circuit stuff. Um, and I kind of helped him like get the business side off the ground of like, you know, how do you set up uh, e-commerce and how do you, you know, run social media? Like all this stuff that is not very glamorous, um, but also really essential. To how do you file your do. taxes as a business? Oh, yeah. Oh, it was, it was a mess. I mean, there was a good several months of like back and forth, like getting all of those ducks in a row. And ideally you do it once and it's done. But right. like, holy crap, it's a lot of work. Especially so, if you have uh, zero idea how it's done. Like if you come from nothing, oh, yeah. oh, of zero, you ground <laughs> zero on it. It's all it's all in Greek. You have no idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was it's miserable. Um, I like designing circuits and everything else I do. I am 100 percent faking it. <laughs> and even sometimes with the circuit stuff, I feel like I'm faking it. Sure. But, you know, we do we do what we have to do. So 
that's uh that's the life story of of EAE. That's that was that's the whole that's the whole arc of it from you know uh the basement apartment to having a real shop. Um pretty wild. That's a that's a big step when when you as a as a pedal company or any builder, any company go to like, "Oh, I need a dedicated physical space that's not my house." Cuz there's a lot yes. of people that you know, there's a lot of very successful companies. They're still in that they're in their house. And mm-hmm. uh, I can mm-hmm. think of like, I literally think, you know, of folks like uh, Grant and Karen from Big Ear, they're still, you know, they still do it from their home. And there's a, there's a bunch mm-hmm. of folks that do it that way. Cause that's, to me, that's where things get real. And they also sort of get a little scary. Cause you're like, Oh, oh we're doing sure. the thing. Is it, where there's the a, overhead changes a lot too. Oh yeah. Overhead changes big time. Is there a moment where you were like, where you sort of second guessed it, you were like, I don't know. Every two or three weeks. <laughs> I okay, good. You are you are sane. I just needed to make sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I I've said this to other pedal builders on the podcast, and I've had a, I've had a bunch at this point, and I love talking to pedal builders because they're all lunatics. Um, it's with, true, with a few exceptions. Like um, I mentioned, I had I've had Mike from Analog Man on the podcast, and like Mike got established way before there were 4 billion pedal companies. You know what I mean? When, Oh yeah. When Mike established, you know, there were a handful out there. Um, now the pedal boom, not just in those builders that already existed selling a bunch of pedals, you had a pedal boom of just pedal companies popping up out of nowhere. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and it's, you know, I think it was like uh what is it? Effects database, right. was adding like, Oh, that's dozens right. of new companies a week yep. uh, for a while. Um, I mean, I, I get it. There are very few businesses that you can start with essentially zero overhead. Um, you know, you uh, get a soldering iron, a domain name, <laughs> um, and, uh, an Adobe illustrator license. You can basically, uh, you know, you can, you can, you can probably get a dozen people to buy what you're selling. Um, yeah. you know, um, what do you do after that as anyone's guess, but, uh, that's something that has always been very appealing to this industry is just how easy it is to get started because it means that the, the friction um, for good ideas uh, to come to life is, is minimal. We'll be right back. This podcast is supported in part by string joy strings. I'm a snob. At least that's what people tell me. I'm never okay with good enough. And that's where string joy strings come in. They're better than good enough. They're the best. Stranger are making some of the finest strings available today right up the road from me in Nashville, Tennessee. They offer custom sets, balanced tension, coded strings, the works. If you need it, they can probably make it happen. You should be using Stringjoy strings, and if you're going to order from them, you really could help this podcast out by clicking the affiliate link down in the description or show notes below. You get amazing strings, I get a little bit of that back to help the show keep going. It's a win-win situation. Get your Stringjoy strings today. I was just having this conversation with a friend of mine. I've got, I've got a buddy of mine, Dean, that was in town. He had a gig nearby. He lives, he lives in Iowa, but he had a gig in Mississippi. He didn't want to drive down, but he also didn't want to fly with a guitar. So he was like, hey, um, I told him he could just crash here. And if he needed to borrow gear, I've got plenty of gear. He can just borrow some. Uh, actually, as we speak, that gear, that gig is today. So I was talking to him yesterday about it. And I was like, <clears throat> he is, he's not a big gearhead. He's not a big pedal head. He's not, you know, he doesn't get into all this stuff. He knows some stuff exists, but like we just started pulling stuff off my pedal shelf. Like, and I, mm-hmm. I am of like guitar, like YouTuber podcaster space. I have a pretty modest amount of pedals and I feel like I have too many, but he just like took a moment or was like, there are so many different overdrives. I said, yeah. He said, how does anyone even sell one anymore? I said, you would be surprised. It's like, it's mm-hmm. the first thing people are willing to take a gamble on that you make is like, if you put out an overdrive, people are going to buy it. At least give it a shot. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah. It's such a weird, it's such a weird world to live in where, um, despite the 4 million options of overdrives, it, it truly is how many overdrives is good for the market. N plus one. <laughs> it's yeah, like one it really more. feels that way sometimes. Yeah. And it's like they're all they're all the same and yet also different. Yeah. Um, I find that very fascinating. It's uh you know, it's a very personal thing. You know, not to like and it feels so aggrandizing to say that, but but uh everyone 
has their own version of that experience, you know, um, plugging into something that feels right or doesn't feel right. And then being like, okay, well, I'm going to put all five of these overdrive pedals on the ground and try them out. And, uh, damn it. They all, they all feel different. They all sound different. Yeah. Um, and uh, it doesn't matter if those differences are obfuscated in a band mix, <laughs> uh, because at the end of the day, the good one is going to change how you play. You know, you're playing mind games with yourself. Um, but if at the end of the, you know, I don't know, art's all subjective anyway. So how far down does that rabbit hole go? Right. Yeah. At some point you just have to let it, you just have to accept it. I, in in that same thing, it's like, I think, uh, I think Dan not, no, not Dan Mick from over on that pedal show once said, um, that sometimes the difference in sound is totally in our head. Like, you know, everybody likes to make that argument. Oh, they don't actually sound different. It's all in your head. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I hate to break it to you. Literally everything you experience on a daily basis is in your head. This That's is true. the only way you can experience is how your brain processes it. If you hear a difference, then by God, you hear a difference. That's just the way it is. I, I definitely yeah. had that experience where a buddy of mine loaned me a bunch of other overdrive pedals that I didn't already have. And like loaned mm-hmm. me a bunch of them. Uh, it was Scott from the effects loop actually sent me home with a bunch of them to try that he had that I was really curious about. And I went plugged one after another into it. And I was like, it, it sounds like the one before and plugged another. Yeah. It sounds like the one before plugged another. It, they all sound the same. The place on the knobs mm-hmm. maybe was different, but they all ultimately sounded the same. And I had this weird moment where it's like, do all of my overdrive pedals actually sound the same? And I somehow decide they sounded differently. And like, I get, I have an appeal to one over the other for obviously no good reason because Mm -hmm. I have, uh, and not to get like listeners, not to get like super psychological and like heady about overdrive choice. This is, this is the dumbest deep psychological conversation possible, (laughs) But, but I have to have it. It's like, this is, this is me realizing how I feel by talking it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can bill me for the psycho- psychologist hours later, John. Mm-hmm. Um, but <laughs> it's like, I have great overdrives. I literally had two more overdrives show up to my house this week that I bought. It's like, they do the thing that the other thing mm-hmm. did, except they labeled uh, they, the knobs cool, differently. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. So that's 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 my discussion about the just the lunacy of the pedal industry that I love to talk about. We all love another new pedal. It's true. Uh, we know what we signed up for. Yeah, exactly. We know exactly what we signed up for. So let's let's talk a little bit about because right now I went on your website today because I was curious. I was like, what's available? And then, you know, I've seen a mm-hmm. I've seen a bunch of these on people's pedal boards on Instagram. And the the reason I and I feel really bad that I was like. I need you to say the name of your company because literally anytime anyone has talked to me about your pedals, they just say EAE, EAE. And sure. I was like, I forgot what they stood for for a second there. Um, <laughs> and I didn't want to get it wrong. And I, I, I feel, I feel would feel worse if I got it wrong rather than just asking, but I went on the website and I was like, man, there's a lot that's temporarily unavailable. So I, I have to ask, are you still experiencing some of the like backlog of supply that a lot of people were going through? in not just post pandemic, but I think there was um, between the pandemic plus the conflict, uh, literally the invasion of Russia into Ukraine um, that's caused some, some pushback on some supply. Uh, I take it. Mm-hmm. You're still feeling some of that. Yeah. I think, you know, things have definitely gotten better. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's for, you know, there's, there's often, uh, you know, to, 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 to just be really blunt about it. Uh, there's always this balance of, uh, you know, like, cash flow involved with these things yes um you know uh if you you know like we're we always are we're always trying to balance out supply and demand i never want to have too much stuff sitting on the shelf because uh we you know we can't really afford to if that if that the money required to build 50 extra pedals that we're not going to sell could go into r and i'm going to put that money into r and d you know um but yeah, we do have a lot of things that are back ordered. The killer, honestly, has been knobs. That's the one that has been really? by far the worst uh, these days. Our main knob supplier is like eighteen months out, um, oh. and uh, there's not much you can do about that, really. Not right now. Um, and there are a few like we we really like our fancy our fancy parts. Um, mm-hmm. And this is not this is not you know oh I'm getting carbon comp resistors because uh, you know they 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 sweeten your tone or anything like that. Um, not to get into the physics of that they do in only very select circumstances. Sure. And I can tell you about that some other time. Um, but the, you know, like, like high quality audio op amps, for instance, or the chips that we use in power supplies, a lot of our pedals do, 
you know, nine to 15 volts or nine to 24 volts, or sometimes even, even uh, nine to plus minus 15, as is the case for a particular upcoming release. Oh, wow. Um, the parts to do that are to do that right are expensive. Sure. Um, so there've been a few situations like that. Um, you know, we also, we work with a contract manufacturer in the U S who does our circuit boards. Um, you know, I like to be able to have a personal relationship with the vendors in that capacity, mm -hmm. especially for something so sensitive as a circuit board that needs to be done right. You know, for me to be able to call up the president of the company when I've got a question and, and uh, you know, and, and actually be able to like level with her is really, really nice. Um, you know, globalization has brought a lot of a lot of good things, but also it can be harder to relate to people when they're in a different time zone or you haven't met them in person. Sure. You know. When you were a tiny, tiny pedal company, like I can't afford to get on a plane and go to China and talk to, uh, you know, uh, first of all, the big, the big manufacturers there, we're not even doing 10% of the volume they would need to, to like play ball. So that's right. a whole other thing too. Um, but having that personal relationship is valuable. Um, and so, uh, but you know, they, they're in a rural area, they have staffing issues. And so it can, it can take some time to get stuff out. So all of this to say, yeah, there's still some supply chain issues. They, the nature of them has changed and it's not as bad as it used to be. Um, and also like, we're just, we have a very small operation and we're doing a lot of stuff in parallel. So it's like, we tend to kind of rotate through things like, you know, for instance, we had a lot of long swords available six months ago. Sure. Um, and we sold those. Um, it took some time. Um, like, it's funny, they were available for a while and it was like, they were kind of easy to get. And then we, so I was like, okay, demand slowing down on these. I'm going to, you know, turn off, turn to turn down the spigot a little bit. Uh -huh. And sure enough, uh, you know, it's coming right back around. And I'm really glad that something I designed in, you know, 2015 um, is still exciting to people. Yeah. I did not expect that. And I continue to be surprised by it. Um, so it's like, that's a good problem to have, but it is still a problem. Right. Um, and so, yeah, we're always kind of rotating between stuff. And then there's, there are some models like the obstructures line where like those enclosures are custom die cast. We order them a thousand, a thousand pieces at a time or something like that. And they take a long time to show up. Um, you know, like there, we had, we had an order of them sitting on a boat for like four months, you know, oh, <laughs> like it wow. was just, uh, or, you know, or on a boat or in port or something. So, you know, we're always doing the best we can to balance it, but this is like, honestly, not my area of expertise. Like I just want to sit down and design stuff. So managing, <laughs> managing inventory is like, it's like pulling teeth. Isn't um, it terrible? I, I don't it like really, it. It really is. I used, you know, I, we, we do, we do what we can. I was going to say, I was assistant manager at a, at a bar for a mm -hmm. while. And part of that was inventory management and just inventory management at the bar is mm -hmm. awful because you're, it's a constant guessing game. Like, okay, we have this many bottles of these liquors. We have this many bottles of this beer. We have, you know, we have all these things in stock. Do we have enough to get through this amount of time before we need to order more? And then you're assuming like, who knows, yep. you know, there could be uh, three frat groups in town that night who decided you're the bar they're going to. And, oh, well, shit, now we're out of Jameson mm -hmm. or, you know, now we're yeah. out of Jaeger or whatever it is. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, it's like, and luckily this, you know, luckily electronic parts don't have, well, I mean, they do sort of, but they don't really have a shelf life, right. you know, like you, it's a, so the worst thing that can happen is being on the hook for inventory you can't sell, but at least it's not going to go bad on the shelf. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's a whole other dimension that I uh, thankfully will never have to worry about. Yeah, don't but. do it. As much as I think pedal builders <laughs> are lunatics, people who open restaurants are bigger lunatics. I, I don't get it. Yeah. Can't live with them. Can't live without them. Um, that's exactly right. Yeah, another, oh, another killer part. Uh, bucket brigade ships. Um, I, I, that one. You're not the first to tell me that, so that's becoming a real issue. Oh yeah. Well, the problem is that there. So there are two companies that make them. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is owned by Behringer. I will not touch them. Yeah. Uh, period. I cannot. That company. That company uh, is evil, and I'm not interested in supporting them. The other one makes a great product, but they, uh, you know, their 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 lead times are something like six months. And gotcha. The BBDs like uh, you know MN three thousand five BBDs common analog delay part. Those things are like 10 bucks a pop. So if you want to build, Ooh. you know, and usually there are two to four in, a, in an analog delay pedal. Right. Uh, so because one only put, gives you what, like 350 milliseconds of delay, yeah. like at most? Yep, pretty much. Um, and so like, you know, for one of the Asheville pedals, right, the the analog, the special edition analog delay has three of them in it. So already 30 bucks in chips alone. Right. Um, and that's 30 bucks in just the delay chips, not counting the op amps, the transistors, the logic stuff, uh, the clock generator, the exponential converter. Um, all of the CV processing, you know, like it goes yeah. on and on and on. Like these things are wicked complicated. So, uh, you know, but to, to be hamstrung by one part like this is kind of brutal. 
Um, and we're dealing with stuff like this, like just constantly all the time. Um, it's a juggling game. It really is. Um, and I don't uh, want to sound like I'm complaining or like I'm ungrateful. There are, there are definitely some parts of this job that I would rather not deal with, yeah. but at the end of the day, we get to make cool stuff for people who are then using it to make more cool stuff, which uh, is very gratifying. You yeah. know, when I find out someone has, you know, this thing that I've, I've, uh, you know, just crawled through broken glass to, uh, to, to make into reality um, is being used um, on a record or something like that. I mean, just, just today, actually, somebody sent me a link to uh, a, a tiny desk concert where someone had used one of our pedals. And I was like, Oh, that's right. Oh, I'm never going to go to the tiny desk, but um, so uh, I don't know if you listen to Bill Orkut at all, but, um, you know, he did this, he does like a lot of like, uh, he did like a guitar quartet record essentially. Yeah. I um, watched that kind of one. Like a, like a Riz chase sort of the way. So, uh, Wendy Eisenberg, who's one of the guitar players, um, is friends with, uh, they're friends with, uh, the band pile and our technician Miranda is the front of house engineer for pile. So through pile, uh, Wendy got interested in the long sword and Miranda was able to hook them up with a long sword. Um, and then they proceeded to use it for this run of shows, which is so cool because like, you know, I, I don't think anytime soon I'm going to be in a band, uh, that <laughs> plays on the tiny desk. I think the odds are like less than 0.1% right. that will ever happen to me. And I'm okay. I've made my peace with that. I make, I make tools for artists. I'm making less art myself. Um, and, uh, so to, to see that happen is awesome. It is awesome. That's like the whole reason I, I do this, you know, obviously there's the joy in designing things, but then you want that thing you designed to be used. That feels that feels really, yeah. really good. Uh, and listeners, if you haven't gone and heard that Tiny Desk concert, it's the Bill Orkut Guitar Quartet. Um, I, it's really. Good. I'm a pretty I'm a pretty avid listener. I don't listen every time one comes out just because I I time I I I don't have that much time. I wish I did, but I try to as often as I can. And that concert with that Tiny Desk was wild. the The way yeah. they play, the way they orchestrate the guitars. Um, their guitars, they don't use all six strings. Like it was a weird, that was immediately something I noticed. They're strung oh, yeah. oddly. Um, just, you got to go watch it. I'm going to, I'm going to link the, it down in the description. I'm going to try to remember to do this. I don't have anything to write on in front of me, which is a complete and utter interviewer fail. Uh, I have nothing to write <laughs> on in front of me. Um, but I'm going to try to remember to, if I don't remember it, just Google Bill Orchid guitar quartet and tiny desk. You'll find it. It's really cool. Yeah. And then look up what all the other guitarists in that quartet are doing on their own yeah. because they're all incredible artists in their own right. Yeah, so absolutely. It's cool. Check it. Check Pretty that rare stuff for out. A band like that to, to exist. Yeah. I, I have been a massive fan of the tiny desk concert for, for a long time. I've actually toyed with the idea. <clears throat> haven't done it yet. I've done something sort of small and similar. Um, cause I, I work in libraries, mentioned it before we started recording and my listeners all know that I'm a, a public librarian. It's what I do for a living. And uh, one of the things I want to do is a music series in the library of live original music and put it on YouTube and call it like songs from the stacks or something like that. And, and just, Oh, you should totally do yeah, that. And do like local artists uh, and the local can mean Mississippi local could mean the South, whatever it is. And I, I think that's sure. a really interesting way to showcase local music. I, I, am completely envious of what NPR has done with the tiny desk series. I absolutely adore it. Um, so if, if you, for some reason you've been living under a rock and haven't checked out the tiny desk concert at <laughs> all, um, um, one of my favorites was, uh, Tedeschi trucks band, how they fit that many people behind the desk. I have no idea. Oh, I don't know how they do it. Yeah, It's great. So building pedals, uh, you're, you're making these really cool things. And, and now that the, the long sword's a little harder to get a hold of, I kind of, I, cause I've been meaning to get one. Like it's one of those things mm -hmm. that I was like, literally was the first one of yours that I saw. And I was like. I didn't actually care what it sounded like. It's nerdy enough that I needed to have one. Um, it's sort of like the first time I saw, and I've told the story on the podcast before. I had I had been a complete like blinders on to the gear industry um, for mm -hmm. a long time because I had like I uh, I know viewers, YouTube viewers, y'all can see this. There was a time in my life I owned two guitars and one amp and a small pedal board, and that was it. I gigged like. 200 shows a year, whether they were big or small. That's what I did. Um, it was only when I stopped playing so much that I accumulated uh, this many guitars. But ain't that just the way? Yeah, it's it's ridiculous because you fill that gap. 
You feel that emotional mm-hmm. gap that, hey, I'm not gigging anymore. I got to feel that musical expression. I buy more guitars. It's dumb. Uh, anyway, I'm recovering uh, in that I keep buying more guitars. Um, so, uh, but I, 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 I got a, uh, I discovered the Wampler Clarksdale and I'm from Clarksdale, Mississippi. And the, oh, the nice. pedal, the, the, the town the pedal is named for. And I was like, there's a pedal named after my town. And that's when I started looking around and realized there are so many pedals I've never heard of now. And I discovered this big gear world. And, um, and so it's like when I saw the Clarksdale, I, I saw it cause a buddy of mine was selling it without having any clue what it sounded like. I messaged him said, I have to have that. Like I'm buying that from you. I don't know what it does. I have to have it. Um, same thing. That's what happened with the long sword. I was like, I, I'm going to need to buy this cause I don't even know what it sounds like. Don't care. Um, so I discovered that I, I, and so that was a complete tangent about how I'm going to get one eventually. Um, so you mentioned the whole amp thing. Is that something still you might mm-hmm. consider? I, the amp world feels riskier now than ever. Yes. Uh, especially with, uh, supply chain disruptions and tubes. Um, you know, it's definitely more and more and more expensive to build them. I, you know, I have wrestled with this question a number of times over the years. Um, I am, I'm mired in so much pedal Mm -hmm. design work right now. Like I tend to, you know, the way, so, uh, like I have like a, I have like for real ADHD diagnosed, like, you know, I didn't get it from TikTok. Um, (laughs) you know, uh, and one of the ways it manifests is I tend to like sort of just do too much stuff in parallel kind of jump around. And, uh, I kind of feel like a, like a snake that ate like a way too big, you know, I feel like a snake that ate a watermelon right now when it comes to R and D. Um, there's just so much stuff in parallel coming through. Um, and I'm hoping that when these, when a a plurality of these projects are like out the door, I can reassess on this because I have, I think three amp designs. Like I know what I want out of them. Um, obviously I'm not going to make all of them, but I would love to actually sit down and refine the best idea into something. The problem is like the the threshold for commercial viability for these things is, you know, it's like all over the place. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the upfront investment is really, really difficult. And I don't know how you sell an amp for less than like $3,000 in this day and age without having pretty substantial economy of scale. Once you factor in like the chassis costs and the carpentry and the Tolexing and the, you know, the transformers and the tubes and like the much larger circuit board and, and, uh, you know, that stuff adds up real fast. It's it's wild. Um, but man, I would love to, I would love to do. So like I had this amp design, there are exactly two that exist. Okay. It was called the Arcanist. Um, already, I'm already into like it. A... <laughs> <laughs> I don't even it need was, to know what it uh, sounds you know, like. That's you're there. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of a, like a, uh, it was sort of like a hybrid between like, uh, like an orange or one twenty and like a Vox AC 30. Not that exciting. Um, I, I don't know. But, I don't know anything uh, else that has that. So I mean, well, it, it was like, uh, I guess more AC 15. Okay. So we were doing the, um, we were doing the, uh, like the pentode input stage thing. Mm-hmm. But then that was going with a James Tone stack, so shelving filters, um, and then into like a like a big bottle like KT eighty eight output stage. And there are a couple of tips and tricks on it. Um, turns out, like I, the, so the there, like I said, there are two that exist. I did actually have one friend who who uh, paid me to do like a fully custom build of it. Um, and about three quarters of the way through, I was like, never again, <laughs> not like this. Um, I think that the there are uh, you know the there are lots of companies that are succeeding in this space. The two that I know the best and can speak to why they're succeeding are uh, Science Amps uh-huh. um, out of Seattle, and it's because Alex has optimized everything perfectly. Um, like just truly, like the you know he gets like a universal chassis with all the holes punched in it for all of his different amp models, and then he designs around those. Right? Sure. Lots of little touches like that that make it feasible for him to say, okay, I might offer you know, four or five different amp models, but the same chassis is for all of them. And I can build a 50 watt, 100 watt or 200 watt version of the amp on this same chassis just by covering and uncovering different holes. Yeah. It's brilliant. That's um, uh, that's what Dr. Z I, does, by the way. Dr. Z. Oh, nice. His, I, well, I, I used go. to have a Maz 18. Um, mm-hmm. And when I had it, and this is this is like early 2000s, I had a Maz 18. And I noticed when I retubed it for the first time, which listeners i did the thing all of you have probably done i definitely retubed it before it actually needed a retube i convinced myself somehow (laughs) i needed to retube this thing i noticed there were extra holes in the chassis and when i emailed dr z about it said yeah it's the same chassis we use for like the mass 38 and the whatever and it's like we just use whatever holes are needed 
Yep. So I think like stuff like that goes a really long way. Mm -hmm. Um, if you haven't played a science amp, uh, they're amazing. I am biased because I own uh, a mother, which is kind of his take on the high watt sound. Okay. A drive channel that is unbelievable. Just a really phenomenal amp I, all around. I've seen them, but I've never I've not I've seen them online, but I've never mm-hmm. played one. They have a very distinctive look, which I feel like in the amp yes. world is very hard. Um it yep. it's hard to be distinctive and attractive. Like yes. in the amp world, it, pedal world is a little easier. Like you can be really creative with your artwork in a pedal. Mm-hmm. Um, amps, they kind of have to, I don't know. They've got to be kind of throwback, but not quite. I, I think of it like right. a guitar maker trying to design their headstock. I could not imagine mm-hmm. trying to design a headstock. Oh yeah. It's that's a, that's an impossible task. It feels like, yeah. but, and yet people keep on doing it. So, <laughs> and doing very Luckily, poorly. Some one. of them, I'm not naming names. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so i think so science amps is an example that does it right i think that uh that benson is another one that's doing it right mm-hmm. um if i if i can get my grubby mitts on a benson anytime soon i will be doing so but um and i think it's just because they are uh extraordinarily well dialed in like yeah. you just cannot get a bad sound out of a benson but also he he tends to splurge where it counts mm-hmm. um you know to so he gets his transformers done by uh brian sowers who uh, used to have a company, well, not used to, he still has a company called Sour Sound, and he was yep. making amps that were impeccable, um, some of the best ever. But he is, uh, with all the love of my heart, a perfectionist uh, to his own detriment and uh, hyper fixated on Transformers to the point where he is, I would, cons- I would say, one of the world experts in uh, tube amp Transformers because he knows not just, you know, how to wind a Transformer, but he knows about the material science of the core materials and also things like really esoteric stuff like the laminate materials. And if you want a dissertation on how laminate (laughs) materials and transformers have evolved um, pre and post the invention of captain tape um, and, you know, for about an hour uh, you can talk to Brian Sowers about it. But so, you know, so Benson's have those transformers in them and because they're made with manufacturing techniques that are appropriate to various eras of tube amp design, um, they, they sound noticeably different and it's crazy how much this stuff matters. But when you're dumping hundreds of volts into a piece of metal, um, like a transformer, uh, the characteristics of that metal do uh, greatly impact the sound. So I love, I love stuff like that. Yeah, um, I and I think so. Those are two ant people who are killing it. Uh, sorry, what were you? Oh, I was going to mention with Brian. He was on an episode of Truth About Vintage Amps with Jason Verlindi mm-hmm. at Fretboard Journal and and Skip Simmons. And I listened to that episode that he was on, and I understood about a quarter of what he said. Um, but he <laughs> absolutely made me a believer. In how I, I was always a believer that transformers matter, like it all, mm-hmm. I, as a, a vintage Fender amp lover, um, I, I'm a big believer in those vintage amps. I, I want, mm-hmm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do. Yeah, you, you're talking about the diagnosed ADHD. Mine's very recently diagnosed, and so it's mm-hmm. like I'm discovering. Well, yeah, I'm discovering all these <laughs> things I do and recognizing them now as, oh, that's that. That's why I think that way. Anyway, again, rabbit, rabbit trail. Um, oh, so absolutely. there was a, an ad recently I saw for a, a vintage, it was a vintage Fender amp. Um, and the, the ad copy that the guy was trying to sell it on like Facebook marketplace, he said, transformer upgraded with, I was like, like hell you upgraded that transformer. There's no <laughs> upgrade for that transformer. Yeah. There's a replacement. Yeah. You replace mm-hmm. that transformer anyway. It's true. Um, but I, uh, so I've always been a believer, but Brian made it sound like alchemy. He makes mm-hmm. it sound like absolute downright witchcraft, like the way you have to yeah. go into thinking about transformers and the effect they have. And I, I, mm-hmm. I absolutely believe it. Uh, but it's also I'm really glad there's people like Brian out there doing the digging and research so I don't have to. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's it's such a multi parameter space, um, you know, to, to understand it, you really have to devote your all of your brain power to it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, because of that, um, now he, his gifts are are being applied to other companies. And for that, we're all very grateful because those amps sound really good. Um, but so I think, you know, uh, Benson was one of the first companies to uh, get hit to those transformers and it shows in their quality. So, you know, so all this to say, if I ever get into the tube amp game, I have to be able to do it uh, as good as as these guys are doing it. Otherwise, that's a standard it's not worth it because. Because I have to, otherwise I would just buy one of their amps. And that's, this informs all the stuff that I make. Like if I make something, it's because I believe that thing, either, either I uh, try to make something that just hasn't been done before. 
Um, like a good example of this is uh, our Dude Incredible pedal. Um, I was going to ask uh, you about that one. Yeah. So the so the basic idea there was I saw Shellac Live uh, was absolutely you know flabbergasted by their guitar tone and I wanted to replicate it. Couldn't get an Intersound IVP and I said, well, uh, can't get the can't get the rack unit, but I can get the service manual, so I'm going to make one. Um, and see what happens. I was then eventually able to borrow one from a friend, mm -hmm. um, compare for accuracy, but we were the first ones to make a pedal out of it. And at the time, I remember, remember being shocked because it sounded so good. I was like, surely somebody has thought to make this thing into a pedal, yeah. and nobody did. Um, and that's always a good feeling to be like, to, to, to be shocked that somebody has not done something and have the freedom to be the first one to do that is like, that's, that's a good feeling. And so, uh, you know, but because I made that, um, it did, you know, my needs were not being met by an existing product. Right. Yeah. And so I, uh, and so that's, that's what I went for. Um, you know, or another example, like, uh, the halberd, right. Is our discrete transistor overdrive. Yeah. I tried so, so, so many of these, you know, um, there's, there's definitely a sound that is somewhere between like a Neve console and like a fuzz face with your volume knob rolled back and like a few other things. And they all, they're all great sounds in their own right but it's very hard to get them to sound good at very low gain and very high gain. Typically the ones that sound good at low gain don't have any, they don't sound good when you crank them up. Right. And the ones that sound good at high gain, if you dial them back, it has that kind of like fizzy, like spitty, ugly thing on the note decay. Yeah. And I spent 18 months trying to get that ugly note decay out of the circuit. And I think we only barely succeeded at that. Like if you run it into a twin, you can kind of still hear that kind of like crumbliness. Yeah. Um, but like that was all I wanted out of that thing. And no other pedal that I bought could do it. I, bought, I tried so many different pedals and I just wanted it to achieve this specific thing. Um, and that's and then, so that informs everything we do. So if I make a pedal, it's because I feel like my needs have not been met by something else on the market. Otherwise, I'm lazy. I'm just going to go buy the thing that does it right. Right. It makes sense. And that's that's the thing I've always wondered about builders where they build something that isn't at least I don't want to say an advancement or at least a variation mm -hmm. on something that exists because there there are a lot of pedal companies that are just building exactly what was available before it just yes. they put it in a different housing I use I use like to use the um what I like to see is I use the uh analog man sun face as an example yes it's a mm -hmm. fuzz face but go buy a fuzz face and put it in the multi scenarios that you might want to put a fuzz in where maybe you had to have some pedals before it, or you got to put it mm -hmm. after it, or you actually need to power it on your pedal board and not run it on battery. Yep. The way Mike builds those, it, it, to me, it perfected the fuzz face for the modern player. So yeah. that's also, what I want to see. At the, okay. At the time he did it too. Yeah. Um, there were no, there were no other options, yeah. you know, um, to, for someone to, to modernize one of these effects was essentially unheard of at the time. Yeah. And so he, you know, he found his, you know, he did, you know, I like to think I did with the IPP, what he did with, with that stuff yeah. where it was like, this thing's out there. It's not a practical form for the modern player. Um, you know, go, go get it, you know, like make this thing, give this thing a second life in a different format. Yeah. Um, that's what, well, I was going to say, so that's, that's what really I think cool. about the, um, uh, the, uh, I, this is my brain absolutely blanking on the dude. Incredible. I keep wanting to call it the dude. Perfect. Which is like a YouTube channel where they do trick shots. The dude. Incredible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so dude. Perfect. I'm like, it's a totally different thing. Um, mm -hmm. the dude. Incredible. What caught my attention in it was not even the IVP. It was the harmonic percolator side of it because there's mm -hmm. not a lot of folks making a harmonic percolator still to this day. I have one yeah, it's that, uh, a Brainia effects. Are you familiar with Eric Brainia? Um, no, I'm not he's, familiar. he's out of California. He, he's a, he builds as a side job. That's his side gig. Mm -hmm. He occasionally builds things for fun. He loves working with germanium. He finds like weird germanium. And so I've got several of his stuff. We've become friends over the years and I've got one of his harmonic percolator style builds. And like, because mm -hmm. I could not find one anywhere and I, I yeah. just not going to pay for the original unit, how much they're going for. So that's how I sure. discovered that one. The dude incredible is like, I was like, Oh, mm. there's another, there's a harmonic percolator. Yeah. I think that, so we did the first, uh, dude incredibles and in, I think 2017 or 2018. Mm -hmm. And at the time there were very few percolators on the market. Yeah. Like it was definitely a known quantity. Um, but, uh, there are a lot more now. Yeah. There are um, more now. Like I think, you know, we would not have released, I think that, well, part of it also is the combination of the IVP and percolator is very, uh, strongly associated with Steve Albini's guitar sound. Yes. Um, you know, so, so to have that combination, it's one of those like greater than the sum of its parts 
uh, kind of things. And so we, so we, we smush them together in one box and it, it's deceptively versatile. So, you know, like it's not just for noise rock though. It does, obviously it's very fun if you just crank the whole thing and, and get your howling walls of feedback. But, uh, it's also nice as like a, you know, a, a very light, uh, preamp EQ thing and then using the percolator as a more chilled out drive. Uh, they pair together really well. So yeah, I was surprised how much I liked the percolator on that lower gain stage thing. Mm-hmm. It just I don't know, it it does that thing to your sound, the the as the guitar nerds call the make gooder. It just, you know, it, mm-hmm. it just takes your sound and gives you that little bit of extra like insert really overused guitar metaphor here. Sparkly, um present, forward, mm-hmm. whatever you want to say, you know that it, it gives it that little bit of extra magic that I like a lot. It makes it a little less flat feeling. Yeah, How many cliches can sure. I work into this description? I'm really, really trying here. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's why I really, I really like that one exists. And the IVP, because of the fact that you guys are the first to do it, I've never played through one. I genuinely have no idea how it would work. Mm-hmm. So I find that really interesting. I like that there is someone out there doing that. You're doing new and exciting things. Uh, and like you just said, you have something else on the, which we obviously can't talk about. Maybe on a later episode, we'll, we'll talk again about the thing that's coming out. But, um, well, let's see. Depends on which thing is coming out. So, uh, <laughs> is this episode coming out? This will um, come out. Um, so as we're recording this listeners, uh, I'll just go ahead and tell you this is coming out. We're recording on May 18th. This episode will actually come out May 25th. All right. Oh, this is perfect. Then. Oh, so we have a new pedal coming out, um, a week from tomorrow. Oh, um, on the 23rd, uh, it is a new installment in the Obstructures collab line that we've been doing. Um, so we make a pedal called the the um, OX EAE Boost. Yes. Um, the Obstructures and EAE Boost. And uh, it's in this, like, actually, I've got one on handy. Oh, perfect. All right. So here, here it is. Um, uh-huh. oh, there's my webcam. Um, you know, it's in this, like, really imposing, like, neo-brutalist enclosure. Um, the obstructures guys designed this and I had to make a circuit that was worthy of, uh, <laughs> the look and feel of this thing. Um, they also make incredible guitars for what it's worth. I have one and it is, uh, it's kind of sounds like a telly on meth. Um, it's very, it's very aggressive. Um, and it also weighs, uh, 12 pounds. It's very heavy. Um, it's a great guitar. Um, so <laughs> all that, all that to say, um, the, uh, so yeah, so the, um, uh, so we've got a fuzz coming out in this line. Uh-huh. Um, you know, we wanted to, we, you know, we wanted to make something that built on this in a more extreme direction. So it is, uh, you know, basically I wanted to make the most, like the filthiest gain stage I possibly could, uh, with the tools that I had available to me. So it's about 80 DB of gain if you're not doing anything else, oh. um, which is just unconscionable. Um, it's, it's unfiltered gain if you want it to be. So like there, it just completely is destroying your signal. Um, and then there are, uh, two more sliders there. Obviously there's, there's obviously a gain and level slider. There is a slider called weight, which is, uh, the high pass it's, it's an input high pass filter and you're changing the cutoff. Okay. So, um, at the minimum setting, you're, you're cutting a bunch of bass, the input, it makes it very tight, almost, almost a metal tone, but it's got a bit of this like sizzly edge that is not very modern metal, but like it will do that like tight palm mute thing. And as you turn it up, the transients get slower and slower and squishier and squishier until it's like a full, like blown out wall of fuzz. Um, now so you're that's talking. really fun. And then there's a, th- a fourth slider called texture, which blends in an analog octave up at the input of the circuit. Um, we do. So that's this is a, a that's a fairly popular concept. You, know, you think about pedals like, uh, you know, like the life pedal, right? Yeah. Like there's a, a sw- foot switchable octave at the input of that. But uh, we're doing um, the octave up in a way that I haven't seen in a lot of pedals. Um, it's using a circuit called a precision rectifier, which uh, essentially is, um, you know, it's a, it's a more mathematically per- perfect octave up. Um, you know, so the way that, that these things work is, you know, you think of a sine wave as going back and forth. Yeah. And if you take the bottom half of the sine wave and flip it up to the top half, it looks like a wave that is twice the frequency. Because the bottom half is, is you know, instead of it going up and then down, it's up, 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 right? Yeah, okay. And so it kind of looks like a weird, you know, it looks like a weird sine wave of twice the frequency. Um, and, but what's really cool is that if you put in like a, like a fifth, for instance, you get other 
combinations of frequencies. So like a fifth actually gives you a sub octave. A third gives you like an octave and a fifth down. I think I've did, I did the math for this earlier today because I'm writing the manual, but <laughs> um, it does some truly wacky stuff. Um, and it's what gives you that, like, you know, when you play, if you play like a third on like a super fuzz yeah. and you bend it, you hear that other note that goes like that, like dive bombs. Yeah. Down. That's the the math of this thing, uh, you know, not being a perfect up, upper octave. Yeah. So we really exploited that. And so basically it's just like the filthiest octave fuzz I could possibly come up with. <laughs> and it's in this format. Um, you know, it's built like a tank. It's indestructible. Um, it's loud as all hell. Um, and uh, I've been using it in my in in uh, in my band, so I'm really excited for other people to hear it because, for me, it was like I like I really like octave fuzzes, but most of them that I played, um, when you kick them on, you disappear from the mix. And yes. So for this one, I really, you know, like, and not even the ones that have like a mid scoop. Like I have, uh, I have a small sound, big sound buzz, right? Uh-huh. Um, and I love that pedal. It is. It sounds like you know, like a monster truck. But uh, even with the mid scoop switch, like the mid scoop setting sounds amazing until you try to play in a band mix. Like it's good for guitar parts where, you know, it's like just a guitar riff and then the whole band comes in. That's when you use the mid scoop. But otherwise, it's like you just don't get anything in a mix. But even in the like, you know, the mid scoop offsetting, all those overtones kind of like mush out your guitar tone. Gotcha. And so I wanted the upper octave to be blendable as kind of like it's like an afterburner, you know, (laughs) like you just kind of are adding in this extra bit of sizzle. So that's coming out next Friday. Um, very, very excited about that one. Um, I think, I hope that this one will be, people will actually be able to get their hands on them. I think we made enough of them. That's also part of why we haven't had long swords because we've been busy building these <laughs> sure. things. And this product line is a little more intensive on the hand building side. Like there's more stuff wired off board. It's like, you know, more, uh, you know, it's just more, it's kind of just ruggedized in a lot of ways. Yeah. People use mil spec for this stuff a lot, a lot of the time. And I have to laugh because, like, I'm pretty sure the military just does stuff at, like, the lowest possible bidder, you know? <laughs> so I'm like, that's not how we build these things. We build them, we build them uh, like we care. I think they, um, I think when they say military spec, they, they mean, like, old school 50s overbuilt military spec. They don't mean current military no, spec. Because, sure. like, when you look, it's, I always, anytime someone says military spec, the first thing I think of is not military. I think of old school high watts like the internal wiring of a high watt holy shit like those things are amazing yeah if you think your pedal board is wired neatly go look at the inside of a vintage (laughs) high watt um and then go back to the drawing board well Mm -hmm. i tell you what john we are approaching the end of this episode we've actually crossed time which is great because that means the conversation was good and this is actually one of the more gear centric podcasts we've i ever do it's like this podcast right. is very much stories and, hey, we're going to maybe talk about gear. Maybe it'll possibly mm-hmm. happen. But no, this has been great. I really enjoy hearing all of this. And we're going to go talk some more over on the Patreon episode about gear and nerdiness. And um, uh, I want to I want to talk some more about the business a little bit and just hear your, your sure. take on it, because especially uh, anyway, there's a lot I can relate to. But before we do that, um, I joked in my last episode that um yeah, I, I'm not Blake Wyland over at the Tone Mob, who I greatly respect and stole most of the format of my show from. Um, <laughs> I, I, but I do want to. I have started adding like a question at the end of the episode, just to have a like a final parting thing. Uh, I don't care what your favorite boss pedal is, though, or pizza. Um, <laughs> so what I'm going to ask is, we are all gear hoarders. We know it. We we are all addicts at this. You wouldn't have gotten into it if you weren't an absolute gear addict. So we've always got something that's like we're looking at that like, oh, yeah, I'm going to buy that next. What's next mm-hmm. on your your gas list? What are you looking at? Let's see. I did. Uh, I kind of preempted the question by saying that the second I've been literally pestering Chris Benson about this, the second <laughs> I can get my hands on a Benson. Um, but uh, no, I think I think for me, um, the the next thing that I, I really I want is a good uh, a good Telecaster, mm-hmm. um, like just. So I've got a GNL ASAT that I I absolutely love, but there was a Telecaster that one of our dealers, uh, Heyday Music in Asheville, North Carolina, great great shop, uh, just like a cool like small intimate space, yeah. you know, in the downtown area. I've never been to Asheville, by the way, just a lovely town. I it, go visit Hawker periodically, um, but they have this. They have like a they have like a Tele Deluxe, you know, with the neck humbucker in it, um, done up with Lawlers. It's black with a maple maple neck, I'm like. That's just like, that's one of those guitars you can just be buried with, yeah. you know? 
Um, it would be a nice, uh, you know, a nice uh, counterpoint to all of my weird aluminum stuff. Um, you know, as much as I love like the Travis beans and, and that sort of thing, yeah. sometimes you just want a telly. So I, I got to follow my heart on that one. I think, I think uh, if not that guitar, then, then there will be one in my future. I think it's pretty likely. Yeah. Very. It's, it's, that's always a very solid one. Um, I, I have been quoted as say, despite being y'all, I almost made it an entire episode without mentioning this. I'm a, I'm a Gibson fanboy. I just am. Um, I still think the Telecaster is the perfect guitar even though that's not like my choice because I don't necessarily mm-hmm. play perfect things, but I think Fender nailed it the first time that whole, sure that did. whole bridge pickup the way it is just slab body, you know, simple neck. It's, it's perfect. Literally if I wanted and had to, which thankfully neither one of those things are true. Um, I could <laughs> own just one Telecaster and do anything I wanted to do. Yeah. 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 And if you're going to get a second guitar, uh, since you mentioned Gibson, I have a I have a, a 1991 Les Paul Studio. That's one of my that's one of the shop guitars because uh, it just, you know, it, it it's a very uh, it's a very aggressive, like super high output pickup yeah. Les Paul. And um, it just like you just you hear stuff with that guitar like it just it kind of if you want to really slam a pedal and make sure it's handling hot signals like that's the that's the one to test with. It's like a big part of the R&D arsenal. Those '90s studios were better guitars than they deserve to be. I feel like that. 100%. I feel like that fell off in the 2000s. It wasn't quite the same. Oh, they yeah. But the '90s studios were something special, and and I I don't think that's just nostalgia speaking. I I can't oh, promise. No. Again, it's all in my head anyway. So those before they started chambering the bodies on the studios. Yeah. Um, that was a big part of it. That's another. I all my guitars weigh too much. That's another reason why. <laughs> yeah, when you said when thing. you said it weighs like eleven or twelve pounds, I was like, yeah, I was like, man, Hartley Peavy's going. Oh, that's heavy. <laughs> yeah, well, I also I have a T. I have a T sixty. Oh, so that God. guitar weighs a million pounds. So let's see. I've got the Travis Bean standard, which is very heavy. Yes. I've got the 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 nineties ninety studio. That's heavy. I've got the Obstructors, which is literally just a slab of aluminum. <laughs> um. And I've got the T60, which, uh, you know, is just solid swamp ash yeah. all the way through. Um, you know, I, I've been I've been joking that some like I'm going to I'm going to uh, I'm going to turn, you know, 50 and have to sell all these and get a Parker fly or something. Yeah, absolutely. Because because um, you cannot you're not going to even be able to stand up straight anymore at that point from these mm-hmm. guitars. It's like for 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 you bassist, y'all are laughing, but it's like strapping on a five string stingray all the time. I had a five string stingray and that was easily the heaviest guitar I've ever held for a oh, yeah, those, long period those of time. Weigh, those are boat anchors. Yeah, they absolutely um, are. Actually, you know what? I might need to amend my question. Oh. Um, I need a mic stand. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> you do need a mic stand. That might be your next gear pick. Uh, <laughs> my arm my arm's tired. For, for the listeners, John has been holding his microphone this entire time. Um because his microphone is back at the at the shop. So his stand, yeah. his stand is over at the shop. So Yeah, I could really I could really use a desktop one. That's <laughs> that's on me. That's on me though. Well, that's awesome. Well, we're gonna go over to Patreon and take a quick little break so that John can give his arm some rest uh before he ends up with like Popeye <laughs> biceps here. Um <laughs> But uh, you had uh, luckily your arms have had all that training from these heavy guitars, so you're you're fine. You'll be yeah, good. exactly. Yeah. So in the meantime, y'all, we'll be back next week, or I'll be back next week. Uh, you can find all of the links for John's stuff down below, all of the socials, the website, the whole nine yards. Click those. Go check them out. Go check out uh, all of the pedals, all the really rad stuff. And uh, tomorrow, when this episode airs go check out the new pedal and buy one because uh, that sounds super rad. You said loud as hell, so you had me there. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> but in the meantime, y'all, be good to yourselves, be kind to each other, and make some noise. Cheers. <laughs>